Right, so this is the International Finance Project. I'm going to make a few general comments first of all. Uh, you can read what's on the screen. You are being assessed not on your statistical knowledge, uh, but on the way you use that knowledge to make an inquiry into, to interrogate a database, to test a question. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a look at what those questions are, how they can be, how they're going to be tested, and so on. So, uh, some general points here. First of all, uh, you are going to need data to test your question, and that data should include 2016-17 data. And you must use university data sources. If I get something that stops in 2010 and is from the uh, Central Bank of Tennessee, uh, then obviously uh, it does raise questions. You must always state where uh, the database your data has come from. Do not think uh, in terms of, well, you know it's where it's from anyway. You must write it as a report to be written by, uh, to, to be read rather by, say, uh, a, a lecturer in the field, but not necessarily myself. Because remember, these are reviewed by external examiners as well. So you must bear that in mind. You must always give reasons why you are selecting data. You mustn't say, well, I was told to do this. Uh, you must create your own rationale. And that that's uh, very important. Uh, and following on from that, there is therefore no right answer. You, you need to explain and reason your way through uh, the the project. Uh, there is an example on Blackboard. It, uh, I would emphasize that it is not an ideal one. It's one that I hope you look at and think I can improve on that. So don't don't uh, start thinking, well, it's the same as the example on Blackboard, therefore it's right. Uh, there is no right. Uh, it's you're conducting an investigation. There are plenty of errors there, but people wanted to have a rough idea as to what a project should look like, which is fair enough. That is a rough idea. It is not an ideal. The, the hand in dates are in your workbook book and manual. I don't want to give them here because uh, uh, it would uh, need to be updated. So task one is to fill out the pro forma part task two is to submit the project. Filling out the pro forma requires completion of the uh, following items given here and uh, we're going to uh, essentially concentrate on uh, your question and how you're going to test your question. But uh, you uh, need to submit this via Turnitin uh, it should just be one side. It is not an essay. It is just a plan of action. So you need clarity. But you, sh you do not need any more than a couple of sentences for each one of these. So, for example, how you test your question. You might, get, if you're testing, say, IFE, you would give the IFE equation. And that tells you exactly how it's going to be tested. Uh, and then uh, answer these other, other questions. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, when you've completed that, you must complete that. If you want to make changes, then you need to see me about the changes. I mark it. One means go ahead, but take note of any comments. You may get a, a mark of zero. Zero means come and see me, because what you're doing is going to take a, a very long time. It's not the right thing. You've not got the right idea. There's something fundamentally wrong that needs uh, some discussion just to put you back on the right path. So it's not it's it's not a judgment as to the quality of what you're doing. It is simply a judgment as to whether what you're doing is feasible uh, in the time given and addresses the task. So you submit your project in one word file. Don't put things like uh, data available in Excel file. Uh, or, or anything like that. It must be a self-contained uh, Word file. That should be a capital W. So the, the Microsoft Word, Word package. Uh, and there's a 1500 word limit. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, it doesn't include numbers, as, as we say there. So usually if, if you've got a database that you're going to report on, and we'll talk about that yeah, 
a little bit later, then um, if, if you sorry um, yes if you've got a database you must report that a database uh, there are um, uh, there's further commentary on how to fill these out if you have any doubts then uh, please come and see myself or Jia there's a total of uh, I think I counted nine hours of, of consultation time available for you and uh, it is up to you to use that time Choice of subject. This is the uh, critical area that you need to decide on if you're going to uh, devise your central question. So you need to choose it. And here we have a, a, a little quote from your. Uh, let's just adjust that a little bit. Uh, a little quote from your manual giving six topics that are commonly chosen. So it might be PPP theory, IFE theory market efficiency and we're going to go through each of these in turn. So your central question might be purchasing power parity in which case you would use the equation EF equals uh, the equation here so uh, it, it's important that you understand what this means because uh, that will guide you in your studies and answer any questions you may have. Uh, there are various uh, options here so you can choose which country you can choose time period uh, different indices for measuring inflation things like that uh, you may argue that uh, last year's inflation should uh, affect this year's exchange rate that sort of thing so that's a lag um, and you may want to use monthly quarterly data and so on uh, expectations I think uh, we'll leave that one out uh, well you uh, it, it's a little bit too avant-garde, shall we say. But normally we look at contemporary data or past data here um, to explain a current exchange rate change. Um, so, uh, you need to uh, go through the following tasks. We'll just quickly go through them, take two countries. Uh, why you've selected, why have you selected these countries. You must reason your way through it, as I was saying earlier. Um, yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, so, so some projects uh, sort of uh, go for volume, and uh, that's not a good idea. You need to just do one or two tests thoroughly, rather than uh, just go for test after test. Um, if you're using the regression, uh, approach then uh, that's obviously going to be your, your model so you would test for the significance of B and for the overall uh, fit of the model uh, you could but uh, it's important in these things that you don't just do a regression say that's it tick uh, it, have, a, have a look at the observations see if they lie on the 45 degree line for example have a look at different periods see if it's better in one period than another uh, you can do much the same with a, an Excel uh, test. In Excel, your model is, is in some respects rather stricter. That is the basic model, and that is the um, variable that you have to include in order to make it equal. So, uh, I, perhaps I could put in a little example. So, our little example here is 5% equals 3% minus 1%, which is the, the inflation difference, plus 3%, which is the error. So, you examine the errors. How big are they? Are they bigger than the difference in inflation rates? Or, you know, do they change over time? Are there positive errors followed by negative errors? And so on and so forth. Okay, um, as it says there, in both cases, the analysis of the error is important. And um, the, as it says there, it it's, does relate to real findings, the, the relative prices home, home and abroad. So uh, this is a very common area for projects. Uh, you need to get the exchange rate. You need to get the two inflation rates. You need to say where your data has come from. You need to say why you've selected the countries. Uh, and uh, why you've chosen those time periods. And the, the reason, say, for time periods can be I selected all the time periods available on the database. 
Well, that's perfectly good reason. When in doubt, just be honest. Uh, there's nothing better. IFE theory, very similar, uh, only the difference is that you're looking at interest rates instead of inflation rates. So, again, two countries, why have you selected? Better to undertake a few tests. The regression issues are the same, and that is the same as well. So, uh, it for, for some reason, it's not as popular as uh, PPP, but in many ways, um, its relevance is just as uh, great because it is about investing abroad and whether your returns from investing abroad are greater than investing in the UK. Uh, and those conclusions are perhaps a, a little bit more uh, relevant than the purchasing power parity because you've got to remember that inflation is an average. So from the point of view of an individual company, uh, the inflation in their particular products might be, might differ from the average, so it, it's perhaps slightly less relevant than IFE, where the interest rates you are applying are those that would apply to uh, an investment uh, company. We have market efficiency tests here, and this uh, relates to the lecture. We looked at uh, the weak form efficiency, which is essentially saying that uh, information, good or bad, occurs randomly when information is designed as the deviation from expectation. So it is randomly good or bad, and it is very difficult to distinguish between uh, a random line and an actual line. Uh, for example, in this graph here, the gold line is has been much shrunken, so it's, it's not as clear, but the gold line is in fact a random line, and the green line is the actual line for the exchange rate changes. Oh no, the, the actual exchange rate. Um, and uh, so you can uh, you can look at the movement over time, look at the distribution of that movement, look at the probability of some of the outliers. You can look at quiet periods and noisy periods. And then you can test for randomness either using the uh, filter test as on the Excel spreadsheet which is available on the Blackboard site under learning materials along with the lecture slides. So you can uh, use that, uh, and adapt that Excel spreadsheet to what you want. It, it has the nested if instructions. Those of you who attended the lecture will know all about that. Uh, and uh, uh, alternative, not alternatively, but as well, you can include uh, mini tap tests, which is really looking at uh, the consecutive uh, changes below the mean and consecutive changes above mean uh, and uh, and remember that that uh, we we need to look at changes here uh, and uh, if it's not uh, if, if there is a run as it were that there, there'll be cons uh, more consecutive numbers appearing above and below than would be expected from a uh, nor uh, from a random process so uh, we're looking at uh, the probability number of runs is random. Uh, so below 0 0.05 suggests that it is not random, that there are patterns going on. Uh, but it doesn't tell you what patterns. Uh, and as we're saying here, this is the noisy and quiet period analysis. So, But, but do note that it is change we're looking at forward rates. There is some data on the Blackboard site for forward rates. I could try, if you want to do this, um, I could try and get some updated data. I suppose that's the one example where perhaps old data but it is acceptable, but only because it is data that I have given you. To, uh, to test in this area, you need to test this particular uh, uh, measure. Uh, you, you may use the uh, not use the change just to illustrate the importance of detrending, but essentially this is saying that the actual change in the spot rate uh, is the difference between the two spot rates, and the forward rate 
uh, given for the time t minus the actual spot rate at time t is the uh, predicted change. So it's actual change uh, versus the predicted change. Right, OK. Um, uh, and uh, for once you're looking to, to find a, an equation that is not significant. If it's not significant, then that suggests that the movement is random. OK, so uh, just run over that quickly again. Uh, time t could be January. Uh, this is looking at February's spot rate minus January's spot rate. And this is the uh, prediction of the forward rate for February uh, given in January uh, compared to the January spot rate. So is this prediction better than that prediction? And for the most part the answer is no. Then finally we can look at exchange rate variation and correlation tests. And uh, if you read this it's uh, asking about it, it's you, you've got a kind of investment scenario that you need to address and to perform this kind of analysis you do really need to have a, a clear idea as to what it is you are testing um, and uh, as it says here it gives one particular scenario you can use this one if you want to once uh, imagine you're investing 100 pounds in the US stock market for one month convert so you've got to convert into dollars and then convert back at the end and during the time of conversion into dollars you get the return on the Dow Jones index so you get two returns you get the returns on the index and the change in the exchange rate so dollar may go up by two percent the Dow Jones index may go up in value by one percent so your total return for the month is going to be three percent that sort of thing. So what you do with the dollar you can also do with the euro and say pretend that you're going to invest in the German stock market for example or the, the French stock market. So so long as you're clear about the, the story lying behind your analysis that is fine. It, it's, it's not a good idea in this area to descend into equations and expect the reader to understand what you're doing. It must be understandable to yourself as well. <laughs> Uh, then finally we, we have the balance of payments model and as I say here this is a, a bit of a data mining model no clear theory and to adapt it from the slides uh, it's the change in the spot it is equal to change in some one or all of the variables below so these and anything else you can think of um, it's um, well you can yeah, I, I've seen one or two done like this. It can be done well. Uh, don't take balances, as I explained there, going from one to two is a huge percentage change. But the same absolute change of one, if it's starting from 100 to 101, is only 1%. So your, your, your percentages tend to be all over the place if you just look at the balance. It's better just to take the uh, elements of the balance, the exports and the imports in this case. How do you get the data? As I've said, only use university data. Uh, you shouldn't have to look anywhere beyond EIU. You can always ask me or Gia if you're having problems with that. Uh, again, not from other sources. Uh, and any problems see myself or Gia. How do you get the data? Well, uh, these are a few screenshots. You, I, I believe this is the student channel site. You, know, you click on library, you go to library, you put in EIU database there, you click on search. Uh, then you click, you, you get to here, there's a whole list of things here, I've cut it short. You click on to online access and then you get to the data selection here. You click on that, then you click on uh, the, the, this comes up, you then choose your countries, you choose the series you want, you choose the years you want, and then you view the tables, and then you export. That You get something like this, where you view the tables, you uh, click on whether you want monthly data, quarterly or yearly data, and then you click on export, and then that should create an Excel file for you to download. Uh, it unfortunately gives the 
uh, the uh, data on the horizontal, uh, which is limited to 250 um, columns. So uh, where you, you can only really download t items, 240 items at a time. Don't be afraid of downloading a lot of data. Um, so, uh, and again, any difficulties in that, come and see myself or Gia, and we'll sort you out within a few minutes. So, you know, consultation is an important part of any research project, any project that you undertake in the outside world. Uh, and uh, this kind of exercise is a very common one uh, in practice, given the availability of databases. Right, so how, how to use the stats packages. Uh, I am hoping, assuming, knowing that you have used these packages before, either Excel or Minitab or both, and uh, that those are the ones to use. Again, if you have any problems in that, come and see us and we'll uh, help you out with something. So if you have problems with, say, nested if instructions, you know what you want, you simply need to come and see us and uh, to um, uh, we, we'll show you how to do it. So you, you don't lose any marks through consultation, I should stress. Writing up your uh, results is extremely important. Many uh, projects fail or do very badly simply because, not because they haven't done the work. They've done the work, but they've just written it up uh, very badly. Uh, and that is true of anything you do uh, in any uh, subsequent studies, whether if you go on to do masters or a PhD, or go into business and write reports. How you write up that report is absolutely crucial to uh, any judgment as to the quality of the report. Now, good write-ups are not about fancy presentation, you know, sort of uh, all the things that Microsoft offers you. A good write-up has to be clear, well-organized, conscientious, evaluative, and reflective. It's got to be a convincing piece of writing, and people are not convinced by fancy presentation. You must use the following structure, um, and uh, innovating sort of saying, oh, I can do better than this, uh, will not get you any marks. Uh, and you can use these actual headings if you want, that's that's not a problem. And this follows the kind of traditional uh, research type approach. Uh, so introducing uh, what you're uh, testing and stating why it's important. Then your test design and uh, you be very clear in this section. Then your results and further tests and then reflections on your results and suggestions for further tests. How to write up your results? Um, okay, so uh, you must give you you must reread what you've written. Um, I, you know, I mean, I I write myself, and I, sometimes I can't believe what I've written. Uh, you must so you must at least leave one clear day. Come back and see. That, uh, and read it for what you have actually written, not what you thought you wrote. If you read it immediately afterwards, you tend to write what you're thinking rather than what you've actually written. So uh, when you're reviewing, ask yourself, is this clear from the point of view of the reader? Are your diagrams self-explanatory? They should be. You shouldn't have to read the text in order to understand the diagram. Um, and in the outside world, when you write a report, the first thing people look at are the diagrams. And if they don't understand that, then they start to think it's uh, perhaps not worth reading. Uh, references are not required for this ex exercise. Uh, you have done other projects. All projects are different. And uh, it's just not part of this exercise. The literature is uh, is very a complex. It's much further away from undergraduate studies than other areas that you may be studying where undergraduates can read research papers and understand them all. That's not the case in finance. So references are not required. You do not need to refer to textbooks or anything like that. Um, okay, so um, here's a list of the qualities required, so you can have a look at that. Um, you cannot be too clear. You can be too unclear. 
So just just remember that. You may think, well, it's obvious. Uh, write it. If, if you've thought of writing it, write it. Don't dismiss something because you think it's too obvious. Uh, and uh, to guide yourself, it, the best thing is your understanding of the subject. The more you understand the subject, the more concise and clear you can be in your explanations and your analysis. And uh, then uh, you must be analytical in presenting the tests, writing an essay, uh, commenting a little more on the line that's going up and down and suggesting tenuous reasons as to why it might have gone up or down is, is not, uh, well, is, is not really what's required. <laughs> So here are some actual examples of poor presentation. And uh, you can see, look, that this is just called chart one. So the title is, is not very good at all. Uh, all these letters, you know, you can write in what it means. It, you, you know, obviously I can guess, but you, sh you shouldn't have to look at a, a diagram and guess what it's trying to say and its relevance. So this is, this minimalist approach is no good. Uh, this this uh, looks good, but it, it, it's it's got problems with it. Um, right, diagrams must have a proper title and reference number. There's none here. The key to the acronyms would help, no matter how obvious. So C A D. Uh, what what does that mean? Um, it, the, the, the students tried to be clear, however, and you know credit should be uh, given for that. But the whole spreadsheet in the appendix uh, and all databases from IEIU. Okay, so they, they, they tried to explain basically um, where it's come from, but it's a little bit too vague. I mean, actually, EIU does give you definitions of the data, and uh, you should uh, you should look at that. Um, so th there's another one down here. Um, yeah, the, the other point is, uh, we, we don't need the exchange, the change in the exchange rate or the exchange rate to nine decimal places, right? You must think of the reader and ask yourself, is what you are presenting, is it readable? And perhaps think of, as I said earlier, the external examiner. Think, would, what would the external examiner say if he, he or she looked at that? This one is, is, uh, a, a bit better. Uh, we've got the uh, exchange rates limited, uh, all, albeit to five decimal places. We normally w would work with four decimal places. These have been uh, sensibly curtailed. Um, you ha have a look at these uh, criticisms. Uh, so uh, as a key underneath would help, the, the, say, the data sources are a, a good bit clearer. The overall title is a little bit vague and it's not clear what these sections represent so you know okay you've sectioned it off um, but then a, a little t title up here would help so uh, presenting data in uh, on tables is uh, actually quite a skill and I have got a, a, a book on how to do this well, which I will put the reference to up on Blackboard, which would help you certainly in your uh, future careers. This is a regression analysis and uh, the presentation of these results. And where we make the point here that uh, this is a, no, where, where does this come from? Um, I think this might come from Minitab. And uh, yeah, that's certainly a mini tab uh, one. Just keep the mini tab printout. Don't mess about with it. Don't cut it up and spread it in the text. Yeah, just keep it all together like this so that it's easily read. And here th there's a scatter plot with the regression, which mini tab does automatically or well, through clicking a few buttons. Uh, and that is always useful. Visual uh, presentations is good. Just because you're using regression doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't have a good look at how the data looks on the graph, things like that. So uh, that's, uh, a, that's how to present the, the regression type.
own output. We do not need references. I made that point before, but I put these up. These are from an actual uh, session uh, submission. Uh, some of these references are highly technical, and it is you know bordering on dishonesty to give this a reference because really references should be of papers that you have read and fully understood, whereas fully understanding these papers is just not uh, not on at all. So this kind of pseudo-referencing is, is not acceptable and it's not part of the exercise. How to write up your results, presenting data, uh, here are some examples. There are worse examples. Uh, I think I've got one with pages and pages of, of numbers in three point. <laughs> it's utterly ridiculous. Um, now, look at this table. It's obviously, I mean, all these gaps here. It just, it just, uh, and do we need it in this grid like this? It, it's just not good. These are, uh, this is someone who's done a screenshot of, of the data. And uh, again, uh, this, this doesn't look good. It, he left this in, he just, just screenshotted it. This is actually from a um, somebody's submission. So uh, the, these are, are not good examples to include in your Word file. This is how data should be presented. I gave up looking <laughs> for examples. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, th th this is from something I was doing uh, actually for the lecture. Uh, for an earlier lecture. So in this case, uh, these are the variables in the columns. Date, or your, it, for most of your studies, you will need a date. Never separate data from its date. So we've got the date, we've got uh, the exchange rate here, and we've got a random uh, walk there. And those are the names of the variables. Could have a little key here explaining what the variables are. Uh, I've missed that out, naughty me. Uh, uh, but what I was trying to show is how to present the actual numbers. Uh, and uh, so there's there's no title here. So there should be a title. There should be uh, an explanation. So it, it's just the presentation of the numbers that we're looking at here. So it, they've got to have descriptions to what variables they are. And then the first five, then dot, dot dot and the last five tells you exactly what the data you are working on, what it looks like in the Excel file. So that's all you have to do, so none of this uh, but this. And uh, then as a last word, you do do consult. Consultation may be only one or two minutes, but it can save you one or two hours easily. So you have to be a little bit organized, work out what your problems are, and uh, come in and see either myself or Gia. And I can assure you that uh, when you uh, take up jobs after your degree, you will be working in consultation with managers, so you might as well start consulting now. No marks are deducted for the extent of consultation. We don't want you to go off into a quiet room, wrap a wet towel around your head and spend hours and hours on your own studying the, the project. It's, it is a joint exercise between myself and Shia and your good self. Okay, that's it. So remember the deadlines and remember to submit your pro forma and your project via Turnitin.